Howdy, howdy. Good to see each and everybody tonight. I pray that each and every one's had a good day today. It looks like some of you got some naps and some of you didn't get naps. Okay? All right. We're going to do just a few things. We're going to update some prayer requests and a few other things and bulletins, and then we'll move right along with the service quickly tonight. If you would continue to remember Sister Fran, she's not feeling well at all. Continue to pray for her. She's got the crud, of course, we mentioned. Dennis, also a goner, continue to pray for him. Also, Wanda Garner. Just continue to pray for her. She's confined at home, still can't walk, so just continue to pray for her. Also, Cindy Perdue with cancer. If you would remember uh, my brother Tracy Billy Danny, he continues to be in the hospital. Uh, checking a few more testing on him. Potassium is low and a few other things, but they're going to keep him for another 24 hours at least. Okay. All right. And then the Reed Teague family, of course, up at Chatham County, he passed away. Remember that family. Also, the Margaret, Margaret Cameron family. Of course, that's Brother Jimmy's sister passed away. Continue to remember that family. Uh, Emma Lee up church. She had a little bit backwards today, but just continue to pray for her. Pray the Lord's still in control of us. Young lady about, I don't know, 24, 25. Set of twins. Uh, so just continue to pray for her. She continues to be up in Duke, I believe it is, at this time in a coma. Uh, Jose Sanchez we pray for. He's had surgery. He's in UNC. He's got a long ways to go also. Of course, James Ivey, continue to pray for him. Do we have any new prayer requests, praise reports, or updates on anything, gentlemen? Yes. He seems to be doing pretty good. I talked to Jules. Uh, he was driving some, so just continue to pray for them. Well, James, he's at home. Yeah, he's at home. He's in and out at home. Uh, he's out of the hospital. He, you know, he's still not doing the best. I guess my understanding, is that right, Lita? I mean, I don't know of anything else. I mean, he's been in and out, riding around a little bit, so uh, just remember him in your prayers. Yes, any others? Yes. Charlie Odom. Okay. Any others? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. You got a doctor's appointment. Two doctor's appointments. And doctors is lucky, you know that. Yes. Any others? Sister. That was Seaford. Scott, you want to open us up in prayer tonight, and then we'll move right along with the service.
just some updated, of course, announcements we had on this morning. Remember, the Potter's Hands meeting next Sunday evening at 5 o'clock. And, of course, we'll be having our special singing next Sunday night, too, the Damascus Ridge Gospel Singers. That's a bluegrass group with instrumental. So please uh, invite someone and come out and support that. And, of course, the 29th, we'll be having our movie night uh, again at 5.30, popcorn and movie at 6 o'clock. If you'd like to make a monetary donation for our sunrise service breakfast on April 9th, uh, please make a note on your check or envelope or see me or Bubba or Rita if y'all want to donate for that breakfast, and it'll be here before you know it. Sweetheart Banquet is September or Saturday, February the 11th from 5 to 7. There's a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center if you'd like to come to that. Uh, please sign up so we can get a head count on that. Uh, bring you sweetie for a great night of food, fun, and fellowship. Okay, Sweetie or whatever, <laughs> just bring them. Maybe they'll get sweeter if they come to that. Uh, uh, I know I've been asked about another brotherhood meeting. Uh, they're talking about having another brotherhood meeting in March. Uh, so just men will have a date for that. So just plan on that. Hopefully we'll have that in March uh, once again. Got a, a reminder here, uh, very soon we'll be cleaning the closet in your fellowship hall. If there are any cleaning items in this closet that belong to you and you would like it for, for it to be saved, please see Paul for that. So that'll be cleaned up back there very soon. If you got something back there, if you want it saved, you better talk to somebody. If you don't, it'll be cleaned out. All right. Okay, I believe that's all the announcements I've got, not unless I miss something. Well, there's, there's a singing heart songs homecoming. That's at the Family Worship Center in Lumberton. Several groups that have been here, the Oxenine Family, Real Truth Revival, uh, the Douglas Band, and some others. And that'll be fe Friday the, at 7 o'clock, February the 3rd, and Saturday, February the 4th at 6 o'clock. So if you want more information on that, we've got that also. Anything else? All right. I believe we've got a congregational hymn at this time. You're going to lead it from over there? All right, let's all stand. Everybody stand. We're going to sing Glorify Thy Name. If you want to find it in your hymn book, it's hymn number 394. 
Once again, Father, for another day you've blessed us with. Lord, we thank you for the services this morning, Father. We thank you uh, for the songs that were sung this morning, the message, Father, Lord, and just your sweet, holy presence, Lord. And tonight, tonight Lord, I pray for the services. And, Lord, I want to lift these young people up to you, Father, and just uh, I pray that they know how special they are, Father, to each and every one of us here, Lord. But more importantly, how special they are to you. And, Father, you have a purpose and a plan for each one of their lives, Lord. And I pray, Father, that they would just seek out that will, Lord, each and every day by, Father, just looking to you for all things. Lord, I know they have many temptations, Father, through so much out there today, Lord. I know the, the old devil wants them to fall in to these temptations, Father, that don't glorify you. And I pray, Father, as their pastor, Lord, and I pray as the, uh, the church family here at this church, Lord, that we will always be there to support them, to lead, guide, and direct them, and above all, pray for them each day. And Lord, I just ask you to be with them tonight. Lord, be with the teachers that they're in class tonight, Father. And Lord, I just thank you and praise you for all that you've done, but even greater what you're going to do. And we pray for those that are not here tonight, Father, those that are traveling tonight, just give them traveling mercy and grace, grace Father. And we just ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Could at this time, I believe we had the ushers come forward for the offering tonight, evening offering. Did y'all hear what I said? I said marvelous grace. <laughs> Did you hear that? I meant grace. <laughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us back here tonight. The Lord be a blessed, beyond blessed. Father, for the ones who get to know you, let the words prevail tonight through the Bible. For the ones that don't know you, what an opportunity is out there for eternity by your side. And thank you, Jesus, for taking your life for us, for our sins, for a wretch like me. Father, use this offering tonight to further your kingdom as you see fit. It's in your name we pray. Amen. change you are the God you say you are when I'm afraid you calm and still my beating heart you stay the same when hope is just a distant thought you take my pain and you lead me to the cross what love is this that you gave your life for me and made a way for me to know you? And I confess you're always enough 
enough for me. I think about a young man years ago that was all about in the world trying to fill the void in my life with the things of this world. Traveling, playing softball, going fishing, going to bow shoots, up on Jordan Lake, there was always something that was always missing. And I thank the Lord on that night I come to the altar through the conviction of the Holy Spirit and that void was filled. And that, void, and that void will always be filled by my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Nothing else is going to satisfy me. He satisfies all. And I thank the Lord for that. Amen. Well, tonight you're in for a treat. I ain't speaking tonight. Go ahead and say amen. No, I'm just kidding. You know, Brother Larry, he's been a big part of this church. Been coming here. He's in town coming tonight. So I'm going to sit back and he's going to bring the message tonight. And I'm just going to be fed tonight a little bit. So. You would welcome Brother Larry as he comes to share the word with us. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Thank you, my brother. Why do you sing a song like that before I have to preach? I'm wiping tears because your love is enough. You know, I think that we all have afflictions, and sometimes it's during those times of dark and lonely hours when you can't sleep, when you're in agonizing pain, you really begin to know the Lord. And you learn something, that's all I need. And if it wasn't for Jesus, none of us would have any hope. My little mind cannot comprehend how a great, Holy, infinite God can love me so much. 
how can God become man? He took sin upon him, the most repulsive thing to God, and take that and pay the penalty for our sin. The justice and righteousness of God had to be fulfilled. Only what God required could God do. What love is this? Isn't that amazing? Ruth chapter 1 tonight, and Pastor Mike, congratulations on a great day today and a, a dynamic sermon. The only thing about his sermon that I see wrong, I wasn't here to hear it. Because I would have loved to have listened to that sermon. I hope that it's recorded from the book of Job, and thank you for delivering that. And church, congratulations on all that God is doing in and through you. And thank you for being a church, praying for each other, caring for each other, loving each other, being there. Miss Lib, it's so good to see you tonight. Your daughters is with you, so girls. And I'm going to say that affectionately. Y'all behave. Mama's there with her stick tonight. Amen. When I read into the book of Ruth, I learn there's a lot of principles that we can see and find from this. I have a series that I'm doing because I'm not complete with it yet. But in each part, each lesson, or each sermon that I have, I like to begin it with a question. So in verses 1 through 6, I begin asking this question. It is, ever, is it ever legitimate to fulfill a need in your life in an illegitimate way? In other words, you have a tremendous need in your life. Is it right to fulfill that need in a way that is not right? Well, Limelech thought so. We looked at that. Now, that, tonight's question, I'll get to it in a moment, but here's what I'm thinking about. What is it that separates sheep from goats? We meet a lot of people in our lifetime, and a lot of people confess they know Jesus Christ as their Savior. But the question is, how do we know they belong to the Lord? I like what 2 Timothy 2.19 says. The Lord knows them that are his. This past fall from October the 12th through December the 31st, B and myself have had over 10 people who were relatives or close friends of ours to pass away. One was her brother-in-law at 62 years of age. Multiple things wrong with him. I remember in probably around March, somewhere in 1978, in the parking lot at Gospel Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, talking to her brother-in-law with Gary, and at that time asking him, and he ever trust Christ as a Savior? And he said, no. I shared with him the gospel. He bowed his head, made a profession of faith. During the next several decades of his life, no fruits of righteousness, no works of righteousness. Life stayed the same. I'm asked to do the funeral, and here's all that I can say. The Lord knows them that are his. Let me say to all of us that are here tonight, don't leave your family hoping that you are going to heaven when you die. Let it be known that you have a follower of Jesus Christ and you're not ashamed of him, that his life your life has changed as a result of me meeting him. That it was like this once and repentance took place. And repentance means a complete change of distance and direction. My attitude has changed. My talk definitely changed. My whole life changed. My outlook has changed. My thoughts have changed. That should be said of all of us. Never let it be said at your funeral. We certainly hope that Larry or Jim or Mike or whomever, we sure hope they went to heaven. Let it be saying this, if there was everyone that I really believe that loved God and is in heaven, it's my friend, so-and-so. Know that within your heart. Ruth, we have a lot of principles that are given to us, so let's begin with verse 7. And the subject tonight is the marks of a true follower. So in verse 7, she went forth out of the place where she was, her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. Now, before we go further, let me fill you in just a little bit. Earlier in this story, 10 years earlier, Abimelech, Naomi, and her two sons had left Bethlehem of Judea, the house of bread and the land of praise, to go down to Moab. What's wrong about going to Moab? 
well, you want to go down to Sin City and live down into the garbage dump? It's exactly what they did. Enemies of God worshiping false gods. But I'm only going for a little while. Then they sojourned there. And then the Bible says in verse 6, they stayed there six years. Follow up on something the pastor said this morning. Your decisions from chapter 1, as I bring this out, your decisions, the consequences of it, if lifelong, what you decide today may not affect you as much as it does your family and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. Abimelech, Abimelech goes down because there's a famine in the land. He hears there, there's a living to be made and you can survive down in Moab. What's wrong with that? That's leaving the house of God, if you please, going down to worship they worship, false gods. But not only that, they were enemies of Israel. The very thing that he tried to get away from is the very thing that had happened to him because there was a famine in the land. Now after this, we see that Abimelech has died. We see that his two sons have died. They had married two pagan women. The women have no children. The family now is left destitute, Naomi with her daughters-in-laws. Then all of a sudden, now we see there's a return back to the land of God. If you are really a true believer in Jesus Christ, you may wane from the faith and draw from, move from the faith, but that light is still there. And somewhere along the line, hopefully it turns on again. In verse 8, And Naomi said unto her daughters-in-law, Go return to her mother's house, not her father's house, but your mother's house, and the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. <clears throat> The Lord grants you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Just not weeping like a slight cry. Literally right out from that, they sobbed. They wailed. They said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope, if I, if I should have a husband also tonight and also bear sons, would you tarry for them until they were grown? Would you stay with them for having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out from me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Ophrah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, a sister-in-law is going back into the people and to her gods. Return thou after her sister-in-law. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these great principles you've given to us that we can learn a lot of, from life or for life from these. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that where there is life within us, Lord, it will spark and will bring forth fruit. We ask tonight that, Lord, we just haven't come to church because it's 6 o'clock, Sunday night, traditional church. But we've come to meet with you tonight, God. We believe that you have something for us to help us throughout this week. And, Lord, who knows, that may even change the destiny of the course of our lives. So we ask tonight for that grace to speak by, guard my lips and my heart, Father, from not saying anything that's contrary to your will or your word. Make Jesus Christ be glorified. And your name lifted up. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may ask, are there any tests that we can have to know whether a person is really a believer? I believe there are two. I believe first one is, it's called the test of time. And 2 John 2.19 says this, they went out from us, but they were not of us. And they went out, <clears throat> excuse me. It says, let me read it over again. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not of us. David Gilt says this, and I love this comment. He said, John wasn't talking about someone leaving the church to begin attending another good church. He meant those who left the community of faith. Those people. This reveals that they were never really a part of God. Peter says it like this in 2 Peter 2.21. A dog turns to his vomit, 
and the sow to their mower for the wallowing in the mud. So the question number one will be, first of all, is that the test of time. If you're really of it, you'll endure. But the second is, is by fire. Very often, false believers will separate from true believers when the faith comes under fire. Many years ago, I worked as a nuclear metallurgical technician building reactors for the United States Navy, submarines, aircraft, and destroyers. And one of the things that taught us in metallurgy is how you begin to make metal pure. And we had to examine metals of chromium and hafnium and metals such as this, non ferrous metals, to see if there was trash or what we had called at that time voids and other things in the metal. And the way that you get the metal pure is the same way that makes gold pure. You put it in the fire, and the hotter that it gets and the longer that it's there, the dross floats from the top, and you remove that, and what is left is pure. Oftentimes in our life, we go through the fires and trials of life, and it removes the dross and the things in our life that is not real. God removes that, that the pure will be revealed within our life. My uncle said it like this, hotter the fire, better the servant. Not that believers have perfect, perfect faith, but under the heats of life, we may falter, but we will have an enduring faith. And we're going to see that from Ruth chapter 1, verses 7 to 22. You see, there's a lot of things that we learned at Ruth that was thrown at her in the verse 7 verses. Number one, she had been away from Bethlehem, which is the house of bread, the land of praise, for at least 10 years, living in all places, in Moab. Secondly, that her husband, Imelech, had died in verse 3. Her two sons, Melion and Chilion, married pagan women, and they died childless, and Naomi now is left destitute. She is defenseless in the land of praise. You remember the verse that says in the Psalms, Blessed is the man whose quiver is full. You ever wondered what that means? That means in the gate. Let's say that Brother Mike and Sister Karen have six boys. And so when he goes out to the gate to meet with all the others, here comes those robust sons of his standing beside him. Now, Mike's not a little guy himself, but all of a sudden now he's got six men to protect him, and likelihood they will defend Papa to the death. Here is the fact that Naomi, her two sons are dead, her daughter-in-laws are now husbandless, and without children, there's no one to defend the family. At any time, in any way, they're left defenseless. Naomi is just an ordinary day lady. If you please, she's a wash lady, if you want to say that. She's not a queen. She's not a princess. She's just like you, ladies, an ordinary lady of life. But there's one thing about her. She has faith in Jehovah. Look at verse 6. Naomi leaves Moab to return to Bethlehem, Judea, only with her faith in God of her fathers and her two Moabite daughter-in-laws, which is Ruth, in Ophrah, that it is, she is totally destitute. There's no camels following her, no sheep, no oxen, no caravans, no U-Haul. She is left absolute destitute, poor, and as the black guy says, we were poor. We were so poor, we couldn't even afford a second O in poor. Amen. That's how bad off they were. So in verses 1 through 3, we learned a man's name. Abimelech means, my God is king. All of a sudden, he begins to decide, I'm going to be the God of my life. Now, look, things are bad. i got to step up the bat. i got to do this. i got to make decisions, and this is what I'm going to do. Let me say to this, it's so easy for us in times of hectiness and trials and troubles and destitute in us to begin to think, i got to do it my way. So he does it his way, and his way is to leave the house of bread in the land of praise, and now to go down to Moab. Did he have a legitimate need? The Bible says there was a famine in the land. He looked out and he saw that the fields were drying up, the rivers were dry, and the fruit on the trees had withered away. And he looks around and he says, My gracious, if I stay here, my family will have nothing. My sons will probably die. I've got to do something. I can't let my kids die like this. And here's the irony of the story. You know what he goes down to Moab for? To escape death. Do you know what happens? He dies. His boy dies. The very thing that he was going to eliminate by taking it in his own hands ends up 
happening to his family. And before his sons died, they did an unthinkable thing that a Jewish boy would do. They married godless, pagan wives, which is absolutely a violation of Jewish culture and Mosaic law. Our New Testament principle for that is be not unequally yoked together. Now we have this gloomy, hopeless setting of a destitute woman driven from homeland because of famine, cruelly robbed of the loved ones she has, sitting in the fields of Moab absolutely with no hope. Isn't it wonderful to know, listen to this, when we come to the very end, God holds the last strand. Imelech tried to control his future, but when that had failed, God steps in. Nahum is in the fields of Moab. She hears that the famine is over in Bethlehem, Judea. So verse 6 says that the Lord visited his people. Listen to this. God loves to visit his people, and what he does, he likes to do so with a blessing. The Hebrew is rhythmic here. It's a promise. The clouds are finally rolling away. With all the gloom and despair, the Bible says, weeping endures for a night. How many times we have said that when we've walked away from a graveside? We put our arms around the loved one who has left, and loved ones, the hot streaming tears coming down your cheeks because cruel death has robbed you of the dearest of life. It seems as if there will never be another laughter or a time of joy in your life. But joy comes in the morning. After Friday always comes a resurrection Sunday. S.M. Lockridge, the old black preacher who is now deceased, had a sermon called, It's Friday, but Sundays are coming. It's Friday, and Mary and Martha are outside of the tomb, weeping their eyes out. But it's only Friday. Sundays are coming. It's Friday, and the disciples are hiding because they're afraid of the Roman soldiers. It's Friday, but Sundays are coming. And he takes that, song, uh, takes that theme and he goes through it and preaches before 45 minutes. The congregation is shouting. He is shouting because it's Friday. The Sundays are coming. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? God meets us in our most destitute moment when we least expect it in our lives. By the way, the word of God uses Ruth. The word that is used here, look down in verse 6. It's capital L-O-R-D. If you want to make a note of that, is the word, and again, the Hebrew is Yahweh. It is found over 6,000 times in the Old Testament, and it speaks about the God of the covenant. Now, let me go back and tell you about the Abrahamic covenant. When the ratification of the Abrahamic covenant took place, normally in a covenant, the two parties that would join together would put their slain animals, clean animals down, and they would walk through that in the midst, joining hands, signifying they have joined together in a covenant. But the Abrahamic covenant didn't quite happen like that. Abraham, God, put him to sleep, and God walked down through the midst of that because God was ratifying the covenant on an unconditional promise. It was not on Abraham's part, not on God's part. It was all on God's part. And when she speaks about the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, it's the covenant-keeping God who appeared unto his people. We often are hard on Naomi, but she responds to the hearing about the God of Israel doing something back. The famine is over. You see, she is out of the will of God. She's been away from the house of God, the land of praise, away from the people of God. But she still has faith, even though, listen to this, even though it is so very, very small, she still responds. Let's come back to the question. One of the tests is the test of time and the test of fire. Even though Ruth has been through the, through the fire of life, losing a husband, losing her sons, at the point of destitution, that spark was still there. And when she had heard, there was life came back to that spark. Notice the word return. Six times in this chapter. And it says, they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. Not all is roses. Naomi is troubled. As they're walking along and going back, she's getting very quiet. You know what those awkward moments are like in life. I had one with my, one of my doctors this week. 
got very, very quiet. I know he wanted to say something, but he didn't say it. So the next time we meet, I'm going to find out what is it you wanted to say that you didn't say. They're having an awkward moment. She's going with Ophrah and Ruth, and they began making their way back into Bethlehem, Judah, and they're not talking. So all of a sudden, she has nothing. She's thinking, I got nothing to offer them. I have no land. I have no home. I have no cattle. I have absolutely nothing to offer these girls. Why in the world are you wanting to go back with me? And so all of a sudden, she's got a share heart. She's a woman. And men, listen to me. You got a sweetheart's banquet coming up. When I do banquets, sometimes I speak on the languages, uh, how to communicate, the six languages of communication. Now listen to this. If you don't listen to your wife in the little things of life, when the tough things and big things come, she's not going to open her heart and share with you because she's going to say this, why should I? He doesn't care about the other things that I say, so why should I tell him this? Now that's a preview. You'll have to hear the other six parts at another time. So she just says, girls, we've got to talk. So now she is going to go to her humanistic side, and she's going to try to persuade them reasons why not to come back with her into the land and the house of bread and the land of praise. So first of all, the verses 7 through 10 is the, pers per the persuasion of worldly wisdom. Look in verse 7. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. Naomi said unto her two daughter-in-laws, Go return to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, and you have dealt as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. So first is she wants to, she wants to persuade them, worldly wisdom. She says, Go. An urgency of this, go back to your mama's house now. This is kind of odd because it's a term, instead of going back to your father's house, go back to your mama's house. What is she saying? Girls, go back home and find husband number two, a good Moabite boy to marry, settle down, have kids, and have a future. And she adds a prayer. Now listen to this. May the Lord, may Yahweh deal with you hesed. One of the greatest words found in the Old Testament, H-E-S-E-D. It can be two S's. It depends how you spell it. It is the parallel word oftentimes can be understood as gape as well, but it is also one of the most significant words of the Old Testament speaking about the divine promises of God and kindness of God. It's more than a casual goodbye and God bless you. She is describing how God deals with these people, meaning this. God is faithful. God is loyal. God is a covenant-keeping God. He deals with you within tender mercies and abundance of things. So what is Naomi saying? Girls, I am so thankful that you have stayed with me. You have stayed with me when my husband died. You were right there beside me. Hey, girls, I'm so thankful that you have stayed with my son's for these 10 years and you have been faithful all the times. But listen to me. I cannot reciprocate that hesed, that kindness to you. I have absolutely nothing left to give you. And if you think we're too hard on her, she has true faith. Right in the land of Moab, she calls on Jehovah. She calls on Yahweh. She doesn't call on Chemos, one of the other uh, gods. Logically, her argue, argument makes good sense. Go back to your own people. Set it down. Listen, you are Moabite women. This is your heritage. This is your land. This is your people. These are your gods. Go back to what you know. She even kisses them goodbye and look in verse 9. And they begin to wail. They begin to weep. They began, listen, almost an uncontrollable weeping where sobbing is taking place. You can hear these women wail as they're crying. Not sniffling. Really broken hearted. They literally lifted up their voices and wept. 
There's a real love between these women because, listen, there's a real bond that has took place with these women. They have suffered more than most women have ever in a lifetime, and they have bonded together through the suffering. They are tight as they can be. Both women say in verse 10, <laughs> Naomi, we're not going nowhere. Wherever you go, we're going. We're sticking with you. Ruth and Ophir at this juncture, they're not persuaded by worldly wisdom. Now, in the Christian life, when the bottom drops out, it's real easy to say this. I'm going back to do what I used to do. I'm going back to my hunting, going back to my fishing, going back to all of these things. Life was good back then. Boy, it's been tough since I've been a Christian. The devil never brings up the bad. Amen? You want to, he wants to tell you, man, look how great you had it. Until you get there and you find out it wasn't so good after all. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 25, There's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Here's the principle. Do not be persuaded by worldly wisdom to make a wrong decision. Life is not, listen to this, life is not made up by the dreams you dream, but by the decisions you make. Let me say that again. Life is not made up by the dreams you dream. I remember in Bible school and during class breaks or whatever, and the guys would be outside. And I remember a couple of some of the guys in the hallways talking about, man, I'm going to Oregon. I'm going to build a super aggressive church. I'm going to show Dr. Falwell what it's like to build a real aggressive New Testament church. Others would brag and all these kind of things. All of these great dreams. None of those guys did a thing. Just dreams. But life is made up of decisions that you make. So Ruth weathers the storm very well. But now, Naomi's got to tighten up a little bit, so she goes down to logical impossibilities. Look at verse 11. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? For yet there are any more, wombs, uh, any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? You know what she's saying to them? She's saying, Look how impossible it is for you to have a life with me if you go to Bethlehem. Listen to her logic. First, I would have to have a husband. You look at me, I'm, I'm an old woman. I'm too old to get married. And, and by the way, what if I got married? I'd have to get pregnant tonight. I would have to have a son after a son. And then do you look at me, my name is not Sarah. Amen. Now you know about Sarah. She's 90 years old when she had Isaac. So she's not Sarah, and she has no husband. The third thing is, girls, you'd have to wait 20 years or more, a whole generation, before you can marry them. You talk about robbing the cradle or marrying an older woman. Boy, this is it. Notice she did not say, listen, she doesn't say, you know, come on back with me. There might be a good Jewish boy in Bethlehem who will see you. By the way, when they look at you over and see that you are an athletic girl, they'll fall in love with you and Ruth. You're a knockout. Man, everybody's going to fall in love with you. She doesn't say that. She just simply tells them that it is not going to happen. Logical thinking. It's impossible that you marry at my age. Have two boys, grow up. That's impossible. And by the way, girls, Jewish boys don't marry Moabite women because we are enemies. Look at verse 13. She adds, and the hand of the Lord has gone out from me. And you know what? Besides all of this, God is against me. She is saying, look at me. Man, I'm bad luck. I'm a time bomb. You stick with me, life is going to be nothing but downhill. That's like bad evangelism. That's like Brother Mike and I go out witnessing to somebody, and then we're witnessing to him and telling him, now look, if, if Christianity doesn't work, go and try Buddhism or go and try uh, uh, Kish, uh, Kishma or something else. Her theology was off. She was self telling the girls, listen, God, I pray, will bless you back in Moab, but God can't help you in Bethlehem. Man, you're talking about a messed up woman in theology. The story of Ruth does this. It shows that nothing is impossible with God. Many mountains in your life, you say, Brother Larry, I just... I don't see no way. 
God can take mountains and turn them into molehills. But you don't understand. There's barren deserts. I see nothing good. God can make streams flow in the desert. If there are any rivers that are too wide to cross, God specializes in parting the Red Sea and the Jordan River. You see, what looks impossible with you is not impossible with God. Ruth is not persuaded by worldly wisdom, nor is she persuaded by logical impossibilities. So now Naomi reaches down in her haversack and got to pull another one out. Look in verses 14 and 15. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Ophir kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her, and she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back into her people and into her, into her gods. Return thou after your sister-in-law. The persuasion of easy street. At this point, they cry. It is a very intense and emotional moment. They are weeping again. Ophrah takes a deep breath. She walks over to her mother-in-law, Naomi, kisses her on the right cheek, kisses her on the left cheek, and said, I'm out of here. And she's gone. You see, she hopped on easy street and exits the stage. I am told that in Honolulu, there's a street named Easy Street. One block down that street, there's a sign that says, Dead End. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew. Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there, by, and many there be which go in thereat. May seem easy just simply going on a track you're going right now, born that way, no decisions, easy street, no decisions to make, no commitments to make, just go on. But the end thereof is the way of death. You're looking at a man who's going to die. He doesn't like to hear that, but I know that. And I'm looking at you who are going to die. The question is, do we know where we're going? We can know where we're going. It's not easy to be in the child of God. I was sharing my brother when I was in China several years ago. A Chinese pastor came to me and said, why do you fight over denomination? For us to be a Christian is life or death. When the communist red guard comes, they don't ask, are you a Presbyterian? Are you a Baptist? Are you a Methodist? Whatever it may be. Are you a Christian? If you're a Christian, then you're apprehended by the guard, and many of them are never seen again. Easy way of going. Remember said there are two tests, the test of time and the test of fire. Ophir and Ruth, Ruth both were tested. Both initially were on the same road. Both showed a lot of emotion. But soon Ophir shows her true colors, and listen to this. She has never mentioned again. By the way, how many Ophers, not Oprahs, but Ophers do you know in life? Not many names. Many women are named Ophra, O-R-P-H-A. No, or if you spell it O-R-P-A-H, that is. But you find a lot of Ruths. We had an aunt named Ruth. Went to school with girls named Ruth. Ladies and men named their daughters Ruth. But I have never yet met an Ophrah in my life. Ophrah kisses. Ruth clings. Ophrah had a lot of emotion. Ruth showed devotion. Ophrah had conviction, but no commitment. You see, it's not how high you jump, but it's how straight you walk when you land. I think there's a lot of kissers in the church today, but few clingers. We give God a peck on the cheek on Sunday mornings and frolic with the world the rest of the week. Look at verse 14b. But Ruth clave into her, uh, her mother-in-law. Listen to that word clave. Circling to me is this. It's found back in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Where a man shall cleave unto his wife. That means they are bonded together like glue. Nothing can pair or to pry them apart. It is to forsake everything in the past and stick yourself completely to something else. When she decided to clave or to cleave unto her mother-in-law, she has left her past. She's abandoned her past. She said, Naomi, 
I am bonded to you for the rest of my life. Naomi is a grieving widow. Ophir is a leaving widow. Ruth is a cleaving widow. Now we come to Naomi and Ophir leaves another plea. Just her final one in verse 15. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back into her people and to her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Now it's peer pressure. Ruth is alone. The question is, how does Ruth respond to this last? Some of you have used these words that Ruth gave in your wedding. Let's look at it together, found in verse 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And where thou diest, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do unto me, and more also, if aught but death part from thee and me. What a jewel. Her commitment is not only verbally, but it's chronologically. She said, I'm going with you from here until I die, until my death. It's permanent. She's going to a land that she does not know, and all that she's heard from her mother-in-law, who is here now a bitter old woman, is not real good evangelism. And when she goes, most likely she's going to face prejustice. She's going to face discrimination, and she may even face death, but nothing deters her. But Ruth shows even greater faith than Abraham. God says, Abraham, get up out of the land and go into the land where I show thee. Abraham, God gave him a promise. God gave him the blessing. God gave him a spouse. God gave him a lot of possessions. But what did Ruth have? She had nothing, no direct word from God, no spouse, no possessions, just a bitter old woman to cling to. So if Abraham is the father of faith, surely Ruth is the mother of faith. So finally in verse 18, Naomi gives up. She couldn't get her to budge an inch. So now, Jesus commands such faith. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or lands, for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall receive everlasting life. Now we come to the final one. And this is where I want to drop my anchor and ask you this question. Have you positioned yourself to be in a place of blessing? That's what she did. In verses 19 to 22, we read, And so the two went until they came into Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were coming to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt with me very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then callest thou called Naomi, seeing the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. When she goes back, the whole town says, hey, she's a strange woman. There's something about that woman. Look at her. I know her. I just can't think who she is. Why, that's Naomi. As Naomi comes back, with Ruth, her daughter-in-law, she sees the side streets where her boys would play. And she thinks she could almost hear the sound of their voices giggling and playing. She can remember that she and her husband walk out in the cool of the evening and enjoy the afternoons together. And now she comes back. She said, look, who is that? She says, don't call me Naomi. I am not pleasant. The Lord, the Almighty, has dealt with me. I have absolutely nothing. There came and I left this land. I had money in the bank. I had two sons in my hands. I had a husband. I had a song in my heart. I have no husband, no sons, no, mo no money. I am destitute. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For I am bitter. God 
has dealt severely with me. But here's the thing. They positioned themselves into a place where God could bless them. Have you positioned yourself in life and moved in a direction and you have served God and loved God and followed God and read the word of God and prayed to the God of heaven and earth? Have you positioned yourself where God can bless you? Listen to me. You that are parents and grandparents, if you can pillar your heads at night, regardless of how much money your children make, or what kind of house they live in, a car they drive. But if you know the heart is right with God, you can pillar your head without wetting your pillow with your tears. Abimelech made a decision. God, you're not taking care of us. This is famine. We're going to die. I'm going to make my decision. The decisions that you make will radically affect your life and your kids and your grandchildren's life. Position yourself to be the word God can bless. It doesn't make sense. But when the fire comes, God has not abandoned, as he did to Hebrew children. And when Nebuchadnezzar had looked in, there were the three men and the fourth man that did the same thing. We have God. We have everything. This very day, in countries around this world, you and I have lost brothers and sisters in Christ who have given their life to simply following Jesus. The news media never tells you these stories. They never tell you where the terrorist comes in and the Islamic radical groups comes in with their AK-47s and the Molotov cocktails and throw in the house, burn the houses, shoot the houses, shoot the church, kill people, go into schools, annihilate all the kids. You don't hear that because we're told it's a peaceful religion. And yet, Jesus says, the world hates me, and they're going to hate you. Position yourself to be the word God can bless you. Now, I want to excite you, because when you read the next chapters, we see that Ruth and Naomi are in a place for God to do the miraculous. By the way, Ruth is found in the chronological order of the birth of the Lord Jesus Pardon my West Virginia hillbilly. It ain't, it don't get no better than that. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for Pastor Mike trusting me in his pulpit. Thank you for my friend, for my brother, as I see him grow and mature and becoming a mighty man of God. I thank you for that. I thank you for this church, Father, for its history, for its present, and, Father, for an anticipated future. And Lord, positioning ourselves where you can bless Lord, we want to do your will, to love you. Sometimes, Father, life just seems as if it's more than we can bear. We often cry out, oh, Father, why? And it seems as if the heavens get silent. But, Lord, when we get down to that last strand, you still hold it. And when you show up with your people, you show up with blessings. Because as a father pities his children, so the Lord pitieth him that love him. We ask tonight, Father, to help us as men and women, as parents and as grandparents and great-grandparents, to make godly decisions, Lord, and to live a life that leaves such a heritage that our grandchildren can say, Mom or Dad, Grandpa or Grandma, Great-Grandpa or Grandma, sure love God. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Mike. I'll stand at this time to be the altar is open tonight if the Lord's dealing with you we always have an open altar there's something on your heart tonight you want to pray about please come tonight let's give it all to the Lord you heard the message never how the Lord's dealing with you please come as we pray and close
like God's children said. I don't know about you, but it has been a great day in the Lord for me. I can go another day because I know he's walking with me and he's going to be with me until the end. And I pray that you've gotten that comfort tonight. Just continue to pray for each other, those on our prayer request list. Uh, Wednesday night will be here soon. So please plan on being here if you can Wednesday night. We'll be right back in God's Word in our Bible study. Still hanging on. Still hanging on with why Jesus came. So just give much credit for that. Anything else before we close tonight? All hearts clear. All right. We serve a good and awesome God. Amen. 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 Brother Wayne, you want to close in prayer, Brother?